Well, hello. I'm glad that you're here today. Pastor Charlie is taking a break before we ramp up into full Christmas mode. So I'm gonna share today's message with you. If you've been watching Pastor Charlie's messages for a while, then you probably remember that he spent most of the summer sharing messages based on the ERC's vision, discover, develop, and deploy disciples as Jesus commanded. Maggie Brandt, our youth director, shared a message in September called Make Disciples That Make Disciples, and she talked about investing in the youth of our church. I'm going to be sharing a message about discipleship as well, and I've called it Ripple Effect. Wikipedia describes a ripple effect as something that occurs when an initial disturbance to a system propagates or spreads outward to disturb an increasingly larger portion of the system, like ripples expanding across the water when an object is dropped into it. Much of what we do either can or does create a ripple effect. The way we interact with others ripples outwards into our social network. Our mood is like a stone when dropped in a pond. It has an initial impact as it hits the surface and then that ripples outward across the pond. The mood that started the ripple effect can affect someone we've never even met. If that mood was positive, that's great. But if that mood was negative, then you may have brought a lot of people down with you. There are plenty of things that cause a negative ripple effect. The spread of COVID is a negative ripple effect that is still interrupting our lives. But many positive things, especially acts of kindness, also create a ripple effect. Our faithfulness in God causes a ripple effect that not only influences the present, but generations to come. If I were to ask you to name some heroes in the Bible, you would likely start to list names of men like Abraham, Moses, David, and Paul, but there are certainly women heroes in the Bible as well. There are even two books of the Bible named after women. One of those books is Esther, and the other is Ruth. I could probably talk about Ruth for the rest of the message, but I only have time to give you the Cliff's Notes version. Ruth had a long list of wonderful qualities. She was brave, loyal, humble, kind, courageous, and loving but it was her obedience and faith in God that changed the world. In the beginning of the book, Ruth is living in her home nation of Moab. Israel was experiencing a famine at the time, so a man from Bethlehem named Elimelech took his wife Naomi and his sons Malan and Kilian to Moab for relief. It wasn't long after arriving in Moab that Elimelech died. After their father's deaths, Naomi's sons married Moabite women. Malan married Ruth, and Kilian married Orpah. About 10 years after they married, Malan and Kilian both died. When Naomi heard that God had come to, her aid, to the aid of her people in Israel by providing food for them, she prepared to leave Moab and return to Bethlehem. Although Naomi told Ruth and Orpah to stay in Moab with their mothers, Ruth loved her mother-in-law and had so much compassion for her. In chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Ruth says, Please don't tell me to leave you and return home. I will go where you go. I will live where you live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I will die where you die and be buried beside you. Ruth chose the path of loyalty to her mother-in-law, even if it meant giving up everything she was used to in Moab including her pagan gods. She became a, a Jew by choice and was faithful to Naomi and to God. Ruth and Naomi traveled back to Bethlehem where she met Boaz, a distant relative of Elimelech. Okay, so here's where we really see the ripple effect. Ruth and Boaz marry and give birth to a son, Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, and we see the provision of God as the ripple effect takes us from Ruth to King David, and then from David to the birth of Jesus. Ruth had no idea that the fruit of her obedience would include Jesus' birth into her family line. God chose Ruth, a Gentile woman, to be an ancestor of Jesus. 
I would say that's a great indication that Christ came to save all people. In Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, we learn about the angel that appeared to Mary. Pastor Charlie is going to share the entire section of scripture next week in his message, so I'm not going to spend much time here. But if you're not familiar with the story, I'll give you a very quick summary. God sends an angel to tell Mary that she will conceive and give birth to a son who would be called Jesus, and he would be the Son of God. What I want you to think about is, what if Mary had said no? What if she said, now isn't a very good time for me. I'm planning a wedding. I have dress fittings to go to. I have to meet with a caterer and taste wedding cake samples. And being pregnant with the Son of God is just not going to work. Oh, and you do know that I'm a virgin, right? Look, I'm thankful that you thought of me, but I'm going to have to pass on this opportunity. I'm sure there are better choices out there anyway. If Mary had said no, would God have scrapped his plans? Would he have chosen someone else? Thankfully, Mary didn't say no. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, she says, Yes, I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. Mary never asked what was in it for her. She wanted to become a contributor. The ripple effect that started with Ruth because of her obedience and faith in God continued with Mary because of her obedience and faith in God, and it has changed the world. We create our own ripple effect when we tell people about Jesus and how he has changed our lives. And this goes beyond telling them about salvation. Jesus came to save, but he also came to transform us. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. I don't think that Jesus was merely suggesting that we do this. We don't call this the great suggestion. We call it the great commission. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, and in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says, You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Paul refer refers to four generations of disciples here. Paul to Timothy. Timothy to trustworthy people and then trustworthy people to others. This isn't a model of addition. It's a model of multiplication. We need to focus on multiplication as well. If we're simply making disciples, that's addition. If we focus on making disciples who make more disciples, that is multiplication and that starts a ripple effect. Jesus started the church to be a movement of multiplication. He invited his disciples to follow him so he could make them fishers of men. He discovered them and brought them in. He was intentional and strategic and modeled what he wanted his disciples to do. He developed personal relationships with them and built them up. Finally, he sent them out. He deployed them. Jesus had no intention of having his disciples remain in a holy huddle. It's important that we become a movement of multiplying disciples. Now, I realize that we hear all of this and it makes sense intellectually, but when it comes down to doing something about it, we have a strong tendency to come down with a bad case of the yeah buts and it hinders discipleship. Have you ever had the yeah buts? It's really common. It's more contagious than COVID. And I think the most common variants of the yeah buts is the yeah, but I'm too busy. And the yeah, but I don't have enough experience. So let's talk about the first excuse. I'm too busy. 
Many of you are too busy. And those of us who aren't actually too busy can certainly make it seem like we are. Most of us will go through a season in our lives where we simply can't take on anything else. When my daughter Hannah was a baby and was medically fragile and then had other special needs, I didn't have time or energy to fully invest in anyone other than my family. Sometimes we experience circumstances that are beyond our control, but that typically doesn't last throughout our entire lives. Many of us can certainly figure out how to take a couple hours every other week to invest in teaching someone how to become more like Jesus. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, this passage isn't about our salvation. The judgment of our sins fell upon Christ on the cross. This judgment is for rewards. I don't want to stand before Jesus and say, Lord, I should have done what you said to do, but I was just too busy. I'm guessing that you don't want to have to say that either. The next excuse is, I don't have enough experience. The tools to help with discipleship weren't so readily available in the past, so many of us have never been formally discipled. I wasn't, but as I look back on my life, I can see that the Lord provided many people who influenced me in my walk with Christ. I'll be perfectly honest, even though I knew that I needed to invest in others and make disciples, I kept putting it off because I didn't feel proficient enough to do it. Making disciples requires faith. At the end of Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God will work through us if we trust him. Take a step of faith. God can and will use you in a mighty way. So you may be thinking, isn't it enough for people to come to church and listen to the messages? No. Disciple making is a one-on-one -on -one back and forth conversation. Preaching is one-sided. The pastor speaks and we listen, hopefully. I read a blog at disciplefirst.com that broke down the differences between preaching and disciple making this way. Preaching is information. Disciple making is about life transformation. Preaching is about content. Disciple making is about character. Preaching happens in the building. Disciple making happens anywhere. Preaching tells a man what to do. Disciple making shows a man what to do. Preaching is in the pew training. Disciple making is on the job training. Preaching delivers God's word. Disciple making makes us accountable to obey God's word. Preaching educates. Disciple making equips. If you call yourself a Christian, if you believe in the power of God's word, and if you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, then you have been called into full-time ministry. We aren't all called to be pastors, but we are called to be full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your personal mission field includes the people that you are typically around, your coworkers, your close friends, your neighbors, and your family. We are all on the front lines. It doesn't matter what your job title is, God has placed people in your life for a reason, and it's important to share Jesus with them. Don't remain a spiritual infant. Once you pass the spiritual infancy stage, you must continue to grow in your faith so that you can become a contributor in his kingdom. In other words, you have to become a self-feeder. One of my biggest pet peeves is when I hear people say, I left XYZ Church because I wasn't being fed. Message 
switches could certainly challenge you to make changes in your life. Changes that will help you become more like Jesus and that will help you to be on mission with Jesus. It's also great for a message to stir up an interest to pursue more about a particular topic, story, or verse. But at this point in your spiritual journey, it's up to you to put the time into growing in your walk with the Lord. And at this point in your spiritual journey, your focus should be on serving other people when you gather, especially those who are spiritual infants. So if you're attending a worship service to be fed and that's the only time that you're being fed, then you are severely malnourished. And that's definitely not a good condition to be in. But let's talk about brand new believers. The believers that truly are spiritual infants. Many new believers experience roadblocks and sometimes those roadblocks cause them to give up on this thing that we call Christianity. So what are these roadblocks that I'm talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm gonna share two roadblocks today. The first roadblock is a lack of leadership. I'm not talking about church leadership. I'm talking about discipleship in general. New believers typically lack a firm foundation in biblical knowledge and truth, and they haven't yet adopted a godly lifestyle. These things take time to build. Without proper discipleship, new believers are left to fend for themselves within the world. They are like sheep among the wolves. God calls spiritually mature believers to walk alongside new believers. The second roadblock is a lack of resources. Just because someone owns a Bible doesn't mean that they know how to read it. Let me give you an example. I like to binge watch TV shows. And I'm not talking about watching TV for a week straight and doing nothing else. I just like to focus on watching one particular show instead of channel surfing and watching something on live TV that just really doesn't interest me and is a complete waste of time. But when I decide to binge watch a particular TV show, I want to be able to go back to the beginning, to season one. I learned a long time ago to start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. So if I'm not able to access every episode on Netflix or Hulu or Prime or wherever, I'll just choose another TV show to watch. Sometimes I decide to binge read. I choose a series of books and just keep reading or listening to the audiobooks until I've completed every book in the series. If I was a brand new follower of Jesus and left to my own devices, I would start at the beginning of the Bible and read through it in order. There are 66 books in the Bible, and starting at the very beginning of the Bible is a terrible idea for someone who is brand new in their faith. You have to get through 39 books in the Old Testament before you get to the Gospel of Jesus, which is what Christianity is all about. The Old Testament is great to read for information. It helps us to learn life principles and spiritual lessons, but the Old Testament is not for application. In the Old Testament, God is speaking to the nation of Israel. That's not us. We're Gentiles. Jesus came to fulfill the law and prophets. I'm not discounting the Old Testament, but our focus as Christians is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which begins in the book of Matthew. Let's say that we gave a new, a new believer a Bible that only contains the 27 books of the New Testament. That's certainly a better starting point for them. But even so, Reading the Bible without any guidance can be so frustrating to a new believer that some of them will just give up. I've seen it happen. I've had the privilege of being a part of churches that saw hundreds of people ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins and be the leader of their life. But many people never learn to surrender their lives to Jesus because they never received the guidance that they needed in order to understand the teachings of Jesus. Many scriptures are straightforward and understandable, but countless other scriptures are not. Think of the parables. They are confusing. Luke shared an example of discipleship 
in Acts chapter 8, verses 29 to 31. It's a story of Philip, an Ethiopian. And I'll give you a little context before I read the scripture. First of all, this isn't Philip the Apostle, but Philip the Evangelist, who was appointed by the Apostles in Acts chapter 6 to be a layman of the church. By Acts chapter 8, Philip had become a successful evangelist. After leaving Samaria, where he had been preaching the good news, Philip was told by an angel to head toward Gaza. On the way to Gaza, he came upon an Ethiopian man. In verse 29, Luke writes, The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go and walk alongside the chariot. So Philip ran to catch up. As he drew closer, he overheard the man reading from the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. Philip asked him, Sir, do you understand what you're reading? The man answered, How can I possibly make sense of this without someone explaining it to me? So he invited Philip up into his chariot to sit with him. Philip didn't just say, sorry man, I know it can be a little difficult to understand. Keep reading it and you'll eventually get it. No, Philip took time to help the Ethiopian understand the word of God. Philip helped the man avoid a roadblock. These roadblocks can be avoided by offering one-on-one -on -one discipleship that is not only tailored to the needs of the disciple, but is also taught at a pace that allows ample time for the disciple to understand and apply the information that he or she is learning. So, how do we do our part and become disciples that make disciples? There are many tools available, but I'm going to share the one with which I'm familiar. About a year ago, I asked Lisa if she would be interested in going through a one-on-one -on -one discipleship program with me, and she was as thrilled as I was to start that journey together. Now, I kept putting it off because I allowed myself to make excuses about having too many things to keep up with in my role here at the church. But in the summer, I decided that enough was enough and we were going to get started. The tool that we use is called Small Circle. Before I talk any more about it, I want you to watch this video. Hi, ARC. My name is Gilbert Thurston. I'm the lead pastor at Exponential Church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And, you know, I've had the privilege of being here at Exponential for the past 10 years. And one of the challenges that I face, like many of you are facing, is how do you disciple people? Well, it was three or four years ago that I met a guy by the name of Steve McCoy, who has a one-on-one -on -one discipleship program called Small Circle. And so we started to implement that here because it wasn't about just making disciples, but making disciples who in turn make disciples. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to take these things that I've taught you and entrust it to reliable men who in turn will be able to teach it to others. So if you think about it, that's four generations of discipleship. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to somebody else who in turn will teach reliable men and women. And so it's like, okay, can we do that here at Exponential? And that's what Small Circle really has allowed us to do. So a couple years ago, I started to disciple a guy by the name of Steve, and actually Steve is here with me right now. And uh, Steve, we went through a small circle and it probably took us about, I don't know, 16, 18 months that we were one-on-one, -on -one, I was discipling you. And one of the nice things about one-on-one -on -one discipleship is that we can customize it. There was one area that you were sort of struggling with in your discipleship. And so tell everybody, what, what did we do at that point? Did we just rush on to the next lesson or what, what did we do? No, we, uh, we took a break. Um, kind of looked over what was available as far as resources to look at. And, um, and this, this was a book I ended up, re ended up reading and it really helped to open up the eyes and understand what we were going over at the time. Right? It made a lot more sense. If you had to summarize the whole experience, how, how would you how would you summarize it then? One is just being more comfortable um, with myself and, and really understanding how to, to use what I've learned and to kind of pass it on and, and to really use what I've learned. And as I said, the important thing with discipleship is not just making disciples, but making disciples who can then make other disciples. So when we got done, what was the decision you made to do then? I made the decision to go ahead and disciple um, another person that was, was Jim. And Jim's here with us as well. Jim, come on in. Welcome. 
Thank and you. Uh, when you were with, with Steve, how was your experience then? My experience with Steve was, was eye-opening. It was more heart-opening. It really opened up my heart to Jesus more, and it just taught me what it must have been like for the original disciples to be with Jesus for those three years that they got to be with him. And you just wrapped up like uh, a couple of weeks ago, and because of the pandemic, I think you guys were spread out two a, years, a, yeah. about a two-year process. But you've made a decision. What is the decision you made? My decision is that I'm going to disciple a gentleman by the name of JT. Once he gets back from Iraq, we're going to start the discipleship program that Steve took me through. Yep. And so that's now going to be four generations of discipleship here at Exponential. I discipled Steve, Steve to Jim, Jim to JT. And guess what JT will do at the end? JT's going to disciple someone. And these guys are going to continue to disciple uh, other people even beyond that. And right now I've got another guy that I'm discipling. And so what we're seeing here at Exponential is sort of this multiplication impact and exponential impact, if you will, of uh, disciples making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So we've had a great experience with it and we want your church to have that same type of experience as well. God bless you guys. So Small Circle is an absolutely free tool that's available to guide you through one-to-one -one discipleship. The entire program is broken into four modules of six lessons each. That's 24 lessons about what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. The first module contains lessons about the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lisa and I just completed this module and will be starting the next module on Tuesday. That module contains lessons about how to build a close relationship with God. The third module is about how to build relationships with others. And the fourth module is about how to become a disciple maker, which of course is the goal at the completion of the program. The 24 lessons are designed to be completed every other week, but there can definitely be some flexibility with that schedule. Lisa and I actually meet weekly and break each lesson into two or more weeks. There's no rush in one-to-one -one discipleship. When you're in a group setting, like a Bible study or a Sunday school class, you don't have the flexibility to ensure that every person understands the lesson completely and has applied what was learned in the lesson to their life. In order to become a disciple maker at the end of the program, the disciple needs to be living out each one of the principles in the lessons. Like I said, Small Circle is just one of many available tools that can be used in one-to-one -one discipleship. But if you're truly on mission for Jesus, you have to become a disciple maker. When you make yourself available to be used by Jesus, you will become closer to Jesus. Availability for the plan of God will put you directly into the hand of God. One of the greatest ways to learn is by teaching others. There have been several lessons that I've been challenged to dig deeper in order to help Lisa understand the lesson. It's easy to become overwhelmed, but, but as I told Lisa, it's not about understanding everything. It's about learning more than you currently know. I'm certain that the Holy Spirit will reveal more to me each time I take a disciple through the program. And that's truly exciting. I want to be perfectly clear that what I'm presenting today with this particular discipleship tool is not a ministry of our church. God may plan to make it a ministry of the church in the future, but discipleship is not a church program. It's a fulfillment of God's design, and we are called to be a part of this great design. Paul reveals the reason for his passion to invest in others in Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. He says, Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth. It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity, with his power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. Discipleship is an eternal investment intended to be one of the most substantial investments 
you'll make in this lifetime. If you've been walking with the Lord and have been a student of his word for many years, then you likely have a strong foundation and would be ready to invest in someone as a disciple maker. I urge you to pray about this. Now, you don't have to pray about if you should become a disciple maker. We've been commanded to do that already. But pray about how the Lord would like for you to do it. How does the Lord want you to start your very own ripple effect? In Pastor Charlie's message on November 14th, he encouraged us to mentor, lead, teach, and develop someone in their spiritual walk. Small Circle can help you do that. Sometime in January, there will be a Small Circle Discipleship Training. I urge you to come and see what it's about. It will help you decide if you're ready to begin as a disciple maker or if it would be a good idea to go through the program as a disciple first. If we have at least six people interested in learning more about Small Circle, Gilbert has offered to come and do the training. He's gone as far as Kenya to train leaders on the Small Circle model of discipleship, so I'm confident that he can provide all the information you need as well. If you are interested in attending the training, please let me know before Christmas if possible so I can get it scheduled for mid to late January. You can simply email me at ncfcogsmallcircle at gmail.com. It may be possible to offer a Zoom option or record it to watch later as well. If you're interested in learning more about Small Circle between now and then, you can go to smallcircle.com and check out the available videos. If you are brand new or relatively new in your faith, that's wonderful. I urge you to consider going through the Small Circle program as a disciple. Your life will be transformed. I'm sure of that. I can't guarantee that we'll have enough available disciple makers right away, but I'll do what I can to keep you moving forward in your journey with Jesus. Send me an email if you're interested in being discipled and I'll add your name to the list. I'm so excited to see how the Holy Spirit moves through this process. We have a promise that he is always with us. We just have to make ourselves available for his use. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share the message that you placed on my heart a while ago. And Lord, I just ask that you penetrate the hearts of those who are hearing this message today and put an urgency inside them to invest in others the way you intend for us to invest in others. Help us to do what we can to further your kingdom. Help us to equip disciples with what they need to develop a closer relationship with you. And Lord, I just ask that you help everyone to create space in their life. Help them to make themselves available and to make room to do what you are calling each of us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.